Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am very happy to welcome all of you to City Hall Park as we approach an important milestone in our collective response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As of this morning, more than 72% of el the eligible population of Chittenden County has received at least their first dose of the vaccine. And 89.6% of those 50 and older have reached that, that threshold. That means that as of this morning, 99,817 people in Chittenden County have been vaccinated. With a daily average of about 1,000 vaccines administered in Chittenden County, we are confident that together we will pass 100,000 vaccines administered before, the, certainly before the week is over. We think it's gonna happen today. I wanna be absolutely clear, while this is an important achievement that we can all be proud of, it has been truly a collective effort. It does not mean that our job is done. Further, there remain significant disparities in vaccination rates between BIPOC communities and non-Hispanic white residents in Chittenden County and across the state that must be an area of continued focus, resources, and effort. We must continue to work together as we have for the last year to ensure the health of our community and the strength of our recovery. We also need to change and adapt our strategies in recognition of what barriers to access remain for many residents. The city has been in discussions with the state of Vermont for weeks and is ready to support expanded vaccination options. And Burlington should be on the lookout for news, Burlingtonians should be on the lookout for news about walk-up vaccination opportunities at North Beach and right here on Church Street. Our goal is to make it as easy as possible for Vermonters who have been waiting, unsure, or have had, who have had challenges getting access to join the large and growing group of Chittenden County residents who are fully vaccinated. Everyone should know these vaccines are safe, they are free, and they are helping bring down infection rates in our county dramatically. Just a month ago, we were at an all-time high of 106 people and one day got infected. And now this week, in recent days, there have been less than 10. This event is bringing together some of our most essential partners in achieving these, these outcomes. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna have the pleasure of an honor of inviting Senator Patrick Leahy uh, here to the podium. We will also hear this morning from Kara al Nizrawi, the director of the Church Street Marketplace and our economic recovery director. Uh, Pitt uh, Keo Marivan, who um, is our community development specialist and has been leading uh, an effort we call the Trusted Community Voices Program, and that has been a key part of this pandemic response. Jacob Bougre, the head of AALV, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, is, is with us this morning. Um, Mark Hughes, the, the head of the Racial Justice Alliance, is joining us today, and we'll hear from Mark and Blaine and Tense, the who has many hats here in this community. Um, she is the head of the Vermont Professionals of Color, which has been a big part of the, the pandemic response. I'm also proud to say she's part of the city team, is a member of the, the racial, equity, uh, racial equity, inclusion and belonging team, and we'll hear from Blaine. This incredible group has worked tirelessly to ensure that throughout the pandemic, Burlington, Burlington has been one of the safest communities in America. In addition, our entire city team, to, in addition to thanking our entire city team, I also want to thank our dedicated healthcare providers, state officials, local businesses, many public and private partners, and most importantly, every Burlingtonian and Chittenden County resident who has worn a mask, socially distanced, and signed up for a vaccine. My message to everyone today is don't let up. Continue your hard work and together we can look forward to a future not far away where our lives expand once again and together we can enjoy that all, all that Burlington and Vermont have to offer. 100,000 vaccinations is an important milestone and, in and a testament to the vaccine's safety and effectiveness and now is the time to get your friend and neighbor vaccinated. We are especially grateful to be able to recognize today the work of Senator Leahy, who along with Senator Sanders and Congressman Welch 
ensured that through the American Rescue Plan Act, the city of Burlington is receiving $27 million to support our ongoing public health efforts and our economic recovery initiatives. This is after a year in which the federal government played an incredible role working with the state and local government, ensuring that we had the resources here at the state and local level to do the work that we are uh, uh, celebrating this morning. Because of the passage of the ARPA Act, we have gone from having a severely constrained budget with the prospect of years of very challenging budgets ahead, Senator, to one where we are coming forward with a full service budget that makes strategic new investments and that does this while minimizing the impact on local taxpayers who are still recovering from this deep recession. Um, we'll talk, uh, when I introduce uh, Cara a little bit more about um, action that we're hoping the city council takes on Monday to, to keep the momentum um, and, and keep making the investments uh, going. And uh, that's only possible, Senator, because, because of your work. Uh, th this uh, is, uh, th the ARPA is of course just the most recent uh, example of decades of uh, incredible actions that Senator Leahy has taken that have protected Burlington, that have protected the entire state, made us stronger, made us better. Um, and we are so honored, Senator, uh, for you to join us here today, be with us in, in this brand new City Hall Park. Uh, I'm gonna turn over the podium to you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and like you said, I, I agree with him what we're accomplishing and bro I forgive me for taking the picture but you know I can't I can't be without a uh, I can't be without a camera and uh, although I hasten to add uh, that I'll never catch up to my son-in-law who first been one of President Obama's photographers and is now uh, Vice President Harris's chief photographer so thank you for bringing me here Marcel and I have been all over the state in the last couple of months and I remember before the sense of pessimism and I now see it changing to optimism I think that we are we really are turning the corner uh, as we were walking up and down Church Street I want to see more of these doors open I want to see the people out there doing the things we normally do I look at the at the Flynn, they say, help us reopen soon. I think when the tremendous gathering we had there, not that long ago when I invited John Lewis to come up here and we had just standing room only. And the, the thrill that was, and, but as he said to me afterward, this is a community. Look at the diversity, look at the people here, look at the questions, look at the young people, look at the excitement. And that's what we want to go back to. And I want everybody <clears throat> to roll up your sleeves and get vaccinated. Um, I like the high numbers we have. We still have people who need to be vaccinated. I talked with grandson Patrick, who is now 15, and he's going to get his vaccination in a, in a few days. Uh, his 16-year-old sister already has hers. Of course, his parents do as do Marcel and I and, and the rest of our family. It is essential uh, that you do that. So I would hope that we, we, we have to keep going. Um, you know, our lives, our country has been divided for many different reasons, some political, some because of the pandemic. Bring us back together. One thing that will do that is all of us, all of us being vaccinated. The, the pandemic has had an outsized impact on, on BIPOC Americans, both health-wise and economically. I mean, that's, that's the kind of double whammy nobody wants to have to face. Uh, and we've gotten billions of dollars in aid, <clears throat> but some of the programs were confusing, hard to access, <clears throat> and I have, um, been working since I 
became chairman of the Appropriations Committee officially in January and as President Pro Tem, uh, I have been bringing together Republicans and Democrats and members of the administration. And Moreau, I've talked about you and what you've done here. And I said, let's let's bring this back together. Uh, I, you know, we talk about the cameras. I, I bring these pictures everywhere I go that I take here. I, I know after uh, Hurricane Irene, uh, Anytime I'd walk in the Oval Office, President Obama would say, uh, everybody pause, Patrick's going to have pictures to show us of Vermont. I said, now that you mention it, but the pictures show what we are. And I wanted to, I want everybody to be united. I look at the pictures on my desk over here, my five grandchildren, my black grandchildren and my white grandchildren. I want the world to be the same for all of them. And I know you do, and we will. And so I'm, I can keep the money coming and I will, but you have to spend it. Uh, well, you don't mind? <laughs> I think that was, I think that was okay. If you gotta send it, Patrick, send the money, damn it, we'll take it. <laughs> uh, but, <clears throat> It, um, there is an advantage. Uh, Bernie's got the budget committee. I have the appropriations committee. In the next year, a lot of the parts we have to fill in are going to go through the appropriations committee. I would urge you, I've got all the members of my uh, office here, uh, John Tracy, Chris Saunders, Polly Major, call them and say, look, this program is working right. This one's not send money here or not here. Uh, we'll listen. So, Bro, I'm glad you're doing this. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of Burlington. Uh, I think of the, you know, this is the city where Marcel and I were married long before all of you were born <laughs> and uh, where we spent time, our kids growing up when I was state's attorney and uh, at my first office in as senator in that building, and this is a special place. Let's bring it back, not to where it was before, but even better, even better than where it was before. Thank you. And I'll take my hat. <laughs> Thank you. Who knows what I have? Look at that. <laughs> the senator was pointing out that this is uh, an, an echo Echo Hat, another uh, institution here in Burlington that wouldn't exist without the center's leadership, and which I've had had the pleasure to serve as a board member on years ago. Um, I, I we're going to hear from some from a few other people in a moment, but before we do, I just want to say um, on behalf of all Burlingtonians and Vermonters, again, Senator, thank you. We know that literally without for your work, without you being in the leadership roles that you're in and, and using that leadership to help, help Vermonters, what would be happening now, it, is, it, is, it has been the difference between hundreds of mil millions of dollars coming to Vermont at this key moment. Uh, and it's a uh, few, few people get to do this work, work in government and have that kind of impact at a, at a key moment. And we're, we're so grateful. Thank you, Senator. And yes, those are, those are key members of the city team excited about the message. The more money is going to keep coming. Library, parks, arts, uh, all cheering that on there. <laughs> and we're gonna, we're, this team is going to do everything we can to keep Burlington that special place you talked about, Senator. All right, next we're going to hear from, and maybe she can come on up, uh, Cara. There, here she is. Come on up. Cara is both the director of the Church Street Marketplace and um, over recent months has taken on an important additional role, which is the director of the recovery. And as our economic recovery de director, Cara is overseeing this deployment of new federal funding, some of which will support the extension again of the public health initiatives that led to this, uh, 
this milestone. Um, and she also is leading the city team effort to design new initiatives that are going to boost and really help lead the economic recovery. Those economic investments that are coming in the, in the weeks ahead will include mobile placemaking, free and reduced cost recreation, such as uh, free paddle boarding and bike rentals for all to really bring, to reopen the, the, the waterfront and the downtown for all Burlingtonians. Um, Pop-up markets, new public art programming, and, um, and, and getting the word out about all Burlington has to offer, making it clear that uh, in the weeks ahead, Burlington, we're almost there, Burlington will be fully reopened for business. We also will take action in the coming weeks to make permanent important constituent, service, consi constituent service capacity. That's kind of a tongue twister, as you can see, for me at least, created uh, by the city during the pandemic, including bridge funding for the Resource and Recovery Center, which has provided one-on-one -on -one direct support for thousands of Burlingtonians over the course of the last year, and immediate translation of city documents into seven languages. With these ongoing efforts and more to come, I'm confident that Burlington will remain an example of collaboration and forward progress through the many challenges and opportunities ahead. Cara is gonna make, make good on those words and welcome to the podium, Cara. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll keep it brief because uh, the mayor covered many of the points already. I'm Cara Al-Nasrawi. Just to give you background, in the past year, as the mayor mentioned, um, I've been running the Church Street Marketplace, but I've also, my team and I have spent a lot of time guiding the business community through what was a painful shutdown and an arduous process of applying for grants and loans and now the slow reopening of the economy and now we're really happy to be looking forward to a full economic recovery while we understand that the health response hasn't gone yet and we're the city team is still very much focused on that i have the pleasure of focusing on reopening the economy fully and getting it reactivated and revitalized thanks to all the ARPA funding that um, our, the, our senators and our congressmen have uh, gotten for us. Um, we have this amazing one-time opportunity uh, and we need to obviously be careful with this money and invest it in our community. Um, in the near term future, we will be focusing on using these funds for a just and equitable recovery from a health, well being, and economic perspective. Um, we're looking to reactivate the community and the economy, as the mayor said, with beautification and activities that everyone can enjoy. Um, we're especially looking, uh, as the mayor mentioned, to more streamlined ways to connect with our residents. What we are doing right now is tracking some of the most amazing programs and opportunities that are coming down from the federal and state governments. And we need a clear, streamlined way to connect our constituents and our residents with these amazing one-time opportunities to make sure that everyone has a seat at the table and is able to take advantage of these once-in-a-lifetime funds coming down. Um, this includes ensuring that all members are of our community are aware of what's coming down the pipeline and how they can access it. Even the members of our community who are non-native English speakers, which brings me to our next speaker, which is Pet Keo Manivan, and she has been working really closely with our Trusted Community Voices team, um, which is helping to get a lot of this information out to our community to make sure that everyone has access to it. We see this as a vital part of our just recovery and an equitable recovery. Um, and I look forward to helping, working with Pitt further to make sure that all of these economic opportunities reach all of our residents. And as the mayor and Senator Leahy said, it feels like this is more of a positive time in our community and we really look forward to reopening and uh, welcoming everyone back. Thank you. Pitt? Good morning, everybody. 
Thank you, Cara. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Senator. Um, my name is Pekio Manivan, and um, I'm Community Development Specialist in CETO. The role of my um, job is focused on... Whoop, ...is on public engagement. Um, and from the early 80s, we've been a resettlement um, location, which has made our population more diverse ethnically and racially. Burlington School District records show that there are over 45 languages in our school systems as spoken in students' homes. However, however, many of our communications and infrastructure outreach systems do not reach our full community. The current COVID-19 pandemic to get out information to the public made it all the more urgent for the city to increase language access efforts and a broad, use a broad range of communication methods and create multilingual health public education outreach to be more informed for our full residents to find relief and to make decisions. With this in mind, we implemented translation and interpretive services in our resource and recovery center, created multilingual citywide mailers, monthly newsletters, PSAs, and updated our websites. We also implemented a new engagement team called the Trusted Community Voices. Led by CETO, the Trusted Community Voices hired five liaisons from the Nepalese, Somali, Congolese, Burundian, and Vietnamese communities. These trusted community voices liaisons help develop strategies to further help the city reach the full diversity of their community, which help the, the residents find utility, information about utility, housing grants, unemployment benefits, food assistance programs, and the liaisons also helped hand out thousands of masks and also helped with COVID-19 testing and vaccine information. So this led to much more actionable processes and programs to help improve equitable distribution and outcomes. The Trusted Community Voices not only shared essential government information, but they also established a two-way good communication and relationship with BIPOC and refugee communities for Burlington. Robust community engagement provides an opportunity to transform Burlington by identifying and addressing challenges in much more of a collaborative manner. This creates much more just and equitable communities. Through this continued work of expansion of language access and the trusted community voices, we will build a much more authentic relationship that promotes racial diversity, inclusion, and creates more equitable opportunities and systems across our city departments and our city towards a path towards recovery together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pitt. Okay, next we are going to um, hear from uh, Jacob Booger. Bougre, who with his team at AALV have been just remarkable during this pandemic. Since February, sorry, we'll pause for this. Okay, so I just want to say a little bit about the work that Jacob and, and the whole AALV team have done working alongside USCRI Vermont. Um, they have run special vaccination clinics for people with limited English skills in both Burlington and Winooski. They've delivered food to those in need throughout the pandemic. They've tirelessly advocated on behalf of the, immig the immigrant and refugee uh, communities uh, such that there have been um, translator, trusted communicators um, from many different groups, essentially at every uh, state vaccination and testing site. Um, they are, in short, a major reason why our community has fared so well in this pandemic. Uh, Jacob, thank you for your service and, and welcome here this morning. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yakuba Jacob Bogre, and I work with uh, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, AALV. 
over the past year, we have been grateful to live in a community such as Vermont and in a state that has always welcomed newcomers. We would not have been able to do what we did if it was not because of the support of the state, the cities of Winniski and Burlington, our partners like USCRI, the Department of Health, and all the neighbors who have been calling to see how they can help and support our work, and also referring their neighbors who are in need of care. We could not afford to work remotely like many agencies. We closed between March and July 6, and had to reopen because families were coming or visiting case managers at their homes, seeking help. So we had to work on a staggered schedule until today. But we were able to do so because we got funding from the state and the city to work safely in our office. But as the mayor said, to also continue to provide support to the communities that we are supporting and working with in Vermont. After the initial phase of uh, testing and educating on the importance of testing and isolating, we had to shift gears towards vaccine. And since the beginning of February, we were able to support 1,914 individuals access the clinics. And this represents over 600 households, 104 caregivers, and as of today, 1,175 individuals got their second dose. This is an average of 3.1 per household. And it is our hope that in the coming days, many families that have not been able to access the clinics will also be able to attend and work towards protecting each other so we can go back to normal. But we could not have done so without the help of everyone here, the state, our delega congregational de delegation, the Department of Health, and USCRI that have been working closely with us and reaching and calling and also helping to enroll families to the clinics. As we look forward to going back to normal, I would like to emphasize on one thing. Many of our families cannot afford to work remotely or work from home. These are men and women who lost their jobs during the pandemic and would continue to do so if we don't invest strategically in supporting their need. One of the biggest groups that has suffered is women, mainly single mothers with children. They couldn't afford daycares because it is not affordable and it is not even available. I hope that the CARE Act funding that we are getting would look at investing strategically towards daycares and childcare so kids, at least from three years old, do not have to have their parents pay for that. School, this should be part of the school district and the school system. And it is really important to invest in this early education so parents can go back to work, learn new skills that can help them empower their life and give back to their state. Hopefully this is something that we'll consider. Before I end, I would like also to ask our delegation here to look at helping our families that are still looking to reunite with their loved ones that are still languishing in the refugee camps. Many families are still suffering and they are still separated. And we hope that in the coming days, the country will look at a comprehensive immigration reform that could help with legal immigration and reunite our families. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for, for uh, Jacob, thank you for that, um, bringing attention to that, uh, the issue of the need for comprehensive immigration reform at the end. There's no doubt that um, Burlington was dramatically uh, negatively impacted by the Trump era policies that uh, so um, dramatically reduced the number of refugees and individuals relocating to Burlington. It's welcome that the Biden administration is reversing that, and we look forward to working with you to and the senator to see that uh, change, positive change in immigration policy continuing. Um, two more speakers, and then we'll uh, we'll take some questions. Um, I, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Blaine Antense, Antense, who is one of the city and community's biggest stars. She's an outstanding part of the racial equity, inclusion, and belonging team, as I mentioned before. Um, but she is really here today in one of her other hats, her role as the operational leader of the BIPOC clinics begun in March of this year. Um, 
I'll let Blaine fill in some of the details about those clinics as well as uh, her organization, the Vermont Professionals of Color. Uh, I'm grateful for her work, her leadership, and really her, her wisdom. She's uh, personally given me uh, uh, a lot of great counsel and um, uh, focus in recent months and really years now she's been with the city team and uh, we appreciate her commitment to addressing the deep and long-standing inequities um, in our community. Blaine, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, Senator. Um, and everyone else who's spoken today. I am Blaine Intense. Today I am doing um, work for the Professionals of Color Network of Vermont. Uh, it's, a, it's a group that's focused on the empowerment and the uplifting of BIPOC professionals of color, um, but really all BIPOC people in Vermont. We are a professional network and somehow we're now doing clinics and I couldn't tell you how we got into that, but, but we're here because we're trying to fill all the gaps that everyone talked about today. The disparity in uh, hospitalizations, the disparity in cases are now leading us today to a disparity in vaccination rates. Um, so our clinics are really set up to do that. But before going into that, all of this is really because of the community partner effort that we have today. We have representatives from the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, Winooski Strong, Vermont, uh, UVM LEND program, um, the Black Perspective. We have obviously the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Department and so many other BIPOC partners here today with us um, who've been volunteering their time, effort, energy, resources, and expertise at the clinics um, that we have every Saturday. These clinics were stood up, this is our eighth week now doing these clinics um, in Burlington that are focused on BIPOC people and the households in an effort to reduce that vaccination uh, disparity, which has gone down throughout the state, but of course in Chittenden County, we're still working on reducing that disparity. Um, it is an example of true community partnership. When institutions reach out to community partners that are led by BIPOC people who can speak for and bring in representation from the rest of our community. Um, it wouldn't be possible without, the, without all the partners that we have. So really a huge thanks to all of our partners and the continued effort that we have. The clinics themselves are happening every week. Like I said, this is our eighth week uh, of doing this. And we started out as a partner effort in collaboration with the city of Burlington, which provided a lot of personnel and resources. Um, and now we're completely community partner led and we'll be growing into uh, a bigger operation as we move forward. But as of now, our clinics provide um, a way for us to mitigate all of the different access um, challenges that, that a lot of BIPOC community members have, not to mention the historical harm that institutions have done to BIPOC communities in public health and healthcare, but also what we're dealing with in the last year of this pandemic in cases, in deaths, in hospitalization disparities, and now that we're taking into our vaccination rates. But our, our clinics offer an opportunity for a simple registration process, one that has more case management and support throughout your process, one where you can call a phone and get a direct line to someone who can answer all your questions and who can support you the whole way. And when you get to our clinics, you're received by people who look like you. And I'm speaking more to the BIPOC community now directly, is that there are people who look like you at these clinics, who will support you, who will greet you. There is music at these clinics. It is the least clinical <laughs> clinic that you could ever go to. And we wanna keep it that way. We have to thank St. Paul Cathedral Church in Burlington for, for giving this space week after week and continuing to offer this space for the rest of the summer. Um, and once you get inside, the registration process is simple. You get in and you're greeted and the clinic flow and you have someone to walk you through this whole clinic that looks like you. Vaccinators as, as much as we can that look like you. Um, an environment that's set up for you and meant to, to hold space for you. Um, and as we wait, these clinics have become a community resource and a community gathering place at this point. There is the, the average 15 minute wait time that we're supposed to wait, but people stay much longer. They stay for a community, they stay for the first time in an anxious year uh, of this pandemic that we're allowed to see each other in person. Some after being fully vaccinated, allowed to hug each other in person, which somehow now is a crazy thing to think about. And then people stick around. We have pastors coming in and doing prayer for some folks. We have people networking there. We have other people seeing each other's family that they haven't seen for so long. So really, um, I can't emphasize enough that these clinics are, are more than just um, a place to get your vaccine. It's a, a place to build community and to support each other after a year of not being able to do so. Um, but I can't say all that without understanding that we have much more to do. As we've said, as I've said today, the disparity in Chittenden County is still very great. 
Um, and, and in fact, that disparity, even if we get to parity, won't really be enough because uh, BIPOC communities are being, being hit the hardest and dying the most and being hospitalized the most throughout uh, the nation. So, so our, our vaccination rates, in my opinion, should be even higher. Um, and, that, and that we are working with these community partnerships and we're thankful for our, all of the contributors that have been part of this. Um, we look forward to continuing to do that. These clinics will evolve as need evolves, as eligibility opens up for younger folks. We'll be bringing youth into, into the fold and we're excited to do that too when they're ready. Um, so Vermont Professionals of Color Network is doing this work now. And like I said, it's crazy that a professional network is doing clinics, but it goes beyond clinics. It goes beyond just vaccinations. Um, the economic recovery is still something that is, is top of mind for all of us here at the city, at the network, um, among all of our BIPOC partners, because we know that when there is an economic recession, it is black and brown people that are hit the hardest and that recover the least uh, quickly from it, and sometimes never at all. So with that, I say there's more work to do. Senator Leahy, I appreciate your offer for funding. We will take it if you have it. Um, <laughs> so let me know. Uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, Blaine. Um, and now uh, our final speaker it will be um, Mark Hughes from the Racial Justice Alliance. Um, Mark has really taught um, Vermont a great deal uh, in his service. He championed the declaration of racism as a public health emergency and played a key role in the city officially making that declaration last summer. And he is continuing to work at the state level to uh, ensure that the state also recognizes this public health emergency. He, he and the Racial Justice Alliance have been one of the key partners supporting the BIPOC clinics here in Burlington. Uh, we have, well, we're, again, we're, we're noting a significant milestone here today. We do so while being very aware there's a lot of work ahead of us. There are many, there are the disparities within the COVID-19 response. Um, and many other elements of public health that will require years of work ahead. I look forward, Mark, to working with you on that, and I'm really pleased and appreciative that you're joining us this morning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I think the last time I spoke uh, with you, Senator, when we were together, I think we were in, we were in the Democratic National Headqu the Democratic headquarters in, in Montpelier, and I think they accidentally introduced me after you, and, and I, I, I told you, I said, thank you for the warm introduction, and I felt like I was a little bit more important, um, but it's good to see you again, and I thank you for all your service um, and uh, the Secret Service protection here, kind of. I am Mark Hughes, and I am uh, the executive director of the Racial Justice Alliance, and I'm really pleased uh, to be with all of you this morning and um, excited about the work of the city uh, as um, we continue to move forward. Um, this, uh, these initiatives that uh, have been in play, you know, there's been many of them, and this, this whole idea of uh, what we're doing with um, addressing the BIPOC clinics uh, initially partnering with the city and then um, lifting up and supporting the uh, the network and, and continuing to do that work. Incredibly important uh, at the time, um, you know, for this time, and um, I just appreciate the effort, but it has not been without um, difficulties and systemic difficulties have brought us challenges along the way, and I think that has to be noted uh, because, um, you know, it's been largely because of the resilience and the tenacity of the black and brown folks that are running these clinics that they've been successful not that anything has been handed to them or that the situation was you know put in place for them to be necessarily successful uh, from timelines on when uh, when decisions were made on and as far as vaccination um, the vaccination of the BIPOC clinic to various decisions that have been made along the way in the systemic um, issues that contributed to those decisions, all of them have been challenging. And I think it should be, it's very important uh, not to, you know, go too far into this without at least acknowledging that. But as we move forward, also understanding that it's because of these folks' resilience, it's because of their tenacity and because of the hard work that they're putting in, that we're putting in, uh, that has made us, that has made this possible. So I just want to acknowledge you and just give a shout out to every single one of the folks, to especially uh, Belaine and Tense for the hard work that has been put into this effort. 
also want to say that, yes, uh, Senator Leahy, it is good. It's very important that, that we continue to bring money here. We do, we, we, yes, we will take that money. And yes, it is good, uh, you know, that we continue to spend that money. And yes, it is good uh, that we do set this economy back up and we, and, and we get it working. But we cannot go back to doing the same thing the same way before we got here and expect different. The reason why black and brown people are hurt first and worst during this crisis is because we are always hurt first and worst during any crisis, whether it was 9-11, whether it was the Great Recession, or whether it's this one, or when it becomes the next one, and there will be a next one. So now is the time not just for us to build back, not just to build back better, but to build back smarter and to build back more equitable. Now is the time for us to invest in creating and transforming some of these systems that are hurting us right now. Now is the time for us to move beyond just a desire, an old white desire to get back to where we were and approach a new right desire to take us to where we need to be. Because if we don't, we will be back here again. And what we've come to understand, if nothing else through this crisis, is, is because black and brown people are hurt first and worst, and because of our contribution to these communities, everybody is hurt at the end of the day. We found that out through vaccinations. We found that out through testing. And how much more do we need to discover to find out more? And now, what we're talking about right now is only COVID. Housing, education, employment, health services access, economic development, and the so-called criminal justice system. All of them need systems changes because they are not serving our communities well. And what that means is, is we don't take money one-time money, lots of money, and ask for more, and take it and invest it in these same systems and take the small things that are hurting a lot of people and make them big things that hurt more people. What we need to do is invest this money in smart ways where we're transforming these, these systems and invest these money in black and brown folks as we make this transformation. We sit on the other side of this building as I conclude. Uh, in September of last year, I believe it was, as we declared racism as a, national, as a public health emergency in the city of Burlington. We did that. And I said to you that we cannot do it without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. We have not seen that yet. It is time that we've seen that. Senator Leahy, it's not enough for us to get more money. Mayor, it's not enough for you to spend more money. We got to do it right. We got to do it right or we're going to keep doing this over and over and over again. And again, black and brown bodies are being hurt first and worst. And at the end of the day, it costs us all. No, we don't want normal. We do not want to go back to normal. What we want to go back to is right. So as I prepare for my first shot tomorrow. Yeah, you can give it up. <clears throat> Yes, this, has, this process has enabled me to make a decision to do so, and I've considered it carefully, and seem, seems like even the FDA is thinking this thing is a good idea. So I'll, as I prepare for my first shot tomorrow, I just, you know, just want to, again, just give a shout out to everybody who's done the work, um, and also um, you know, remind, you know, remind you that the way in which we've done this work hasn't necessarily been the right way. You know, I want to leave you with just a, a thought, just for example, you know, when we start talking about you know, economically, you know, how we invest in our black and brown communities. That work does not stop at the AALV. That work does not stop when we say that new Americans are taken care of. Do we love new Americans? That is one of my best friends. That is one of my best friends. Economically, you are dividing us when you do that. Don't do that. There's a broad community that we need to be addressing. Yes, I said it publicly and it needs to be said more often. Your job is, black folks does not equal immigrant and new Americans. Hard stop. Let's get all of the work done because there are, there's a lot of communities that are not benefiting from this economic development, Mr. Mayor. Let's get this right. So thank you for your time. Have a great afternoon or morning or whatever it is. Okay.
Um, thank you, Mark. Thank you for your laser focus on making sure we continue making progress. Um, I do just want to uh, thank two other people who are here this morning we're not going to hear from, but Louis Calderon has also been a central part of this response, BIPOC clinic response, and appreciate your leadership, Louis. And uh, uh, Brian Lowe is here this morning, and I know you've all seen him on our briefings, has been um, the city's COVID leader from the start. And uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be at this milestone today, Brian, without your personal um, commitment as well. You've been a huge contributor.